There's this irresistible wave that is going across America. America is an empire. European tolerance is the Holocaust, is the Spanish Inquisition, is the Warsaw Pogrom, is the genocide being committed by the Serbians against the Bosnians. Is Netanyahu out of control? I'm like, the reason we're focusing on labor is because we want to show that you can't get to power through genocide. But there is this argument that you are deeply sectarian. Biden is certainly at ease that nothing will come from the Muslim world. Saudi UAE at least, they are in the Zionist camp. Sami Hamdi for the past five months has helped us to untangle and understand the motives and actions of the actors that wage genocide in Gaza. The conflict, if that is even a proper term to use, seems to be continuing despite discussions of an end game. At the time of recording this interview, we have heard from Joe Biden casually licking an ice cream and talking of ceasefires when tens of thousands starve in northern Gaza. The callousness with which the West now talk of mopping up a crime scene is staggering. How can a liberal West fixated on preaching rights, how can they have maintained this collective pretense? Today, we explore these two conflicts and in a way, they are one. They are recent episodes of a Muslim world in crisis. Our ummah today lives in a perpetual state of conflict. Can we escape this dire situation? We are now a hundred years since the former devise of the Ottoman state, the Ottoman Caliphate. What does the next hundred years look like? Sami Hamdi, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back to The Thinking Muslim. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for having me, Muhammad. Jazakallah khair. Well, it's uh, wonderful yet again to have you with us and we really honour the time you, you give to our programme. Sami, I noticed that you've been moving around the world. You spend a lot of time in America, as you told us in the last session, and also in Canada. And you're going to Australia, I believe. What's the sort of reception you're getting? Bismillah First of all, I'm the one honored to be here. It's not the other way around, Bismillah, mashallah. And a lot of people send their salam to you, Muhammad, as well, and the Thinking Muslim podcast. I think that my observations of America are that overwhelmingly, not just Muslims, but non-Muslims as well, a lot of them have changed their minds with regards to what's happening in Gaza. A lot of non-Muslims have are openly stating that they cannot vote for genocide, Joe, that they cannot vote for genocide. And as a result, there is this very unique position that the Muslims in America find themselves in, whereby they find themselves not alone in seeking to punish Biden. And I think that's what's really started to concern Biden and the Democrats. There was an article recently that said that Biden is now concerned about the left flank, the left members of his party who are now saying that we also cannot vote for genocide, Joe. There was uh, 13 pastors of the of African-American churches who wrote a letter saying, we cannot tell our congregation to vote for you, which is one of the reasons Biden started his primary campaign in South Carolina in order to try to find to what extent has he been damaged in Africa, in, in, in the, amongst the African-American population. Mm -hmm. The point here being is my observation, that the reception in America to the idea of punishing genocide, Joe, punishing a genocide, punishing a politician who gave the cover for a genocide and proactively supported it by sending weapons, I don't think there's much debate in terms of this regard. There is a minority debate taking place in terms of how do you punish him? Mm -hmm. And I think there are two schools of thought. There is one thought in which you can pressure or, or one in which you simply don't vote for him and you tolerate the consequences, i.e. a Trump presidency. And the other perhaps is a bit more nuanced, the idea that you can pressure the Democrat Party to perhaps change the presidential ticket in which you convince the Democrats to change Biden as the representative, which seems unlikely. But then in, in any case, there was an article in The Atlantic, maybe about a week from this, a week ago from this recording, in which it suggested it called on the Democrats to change Biden. That look, if you Biden is your candidate, you are going to lose. You need to consider uh, changing uh, Biden. And that's why now you have the emergence of these campaigns, uncommitted and the like. I think that while the idea is clear, the idea of putting pressure on Biden, I do think that there are still some organizations that see some hope for Biden to redeem himself amongst the Muslim community, mm -hmm. which is a very dangerous approach in my opinion. But I think 99% of the Muslim community uh, in the US now, I, 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 I want to punish Biden. In Canada, I found that the, the room for debate was much more uh, limited than it was in the United States. In the United States, I spoke at Berkeley, at Stanford, at UCLA, uh, at, at, at some of these other universities as well. And although in Stanford, there was some sort of, uh, there was some backlash from uh, uh, Zionists who were coming out. And, and I emphasize the difference always between Zionists and Jews, as you've seen very clearly, anybody watching Think a Muslim podcast, can see the interviews with the likes of Avi Shleim and the likes, they'll see there's a clear difference between Jews and Zionism. I, I found that there were some Zionists who protested to some of the talks that took place in Stanford. They came and they heckled. But the overwhelming mood that I found in America was 
that even amongst non-Muslims, there is a shift away from Biden, not for Trump, but rather a lamentation that how did U.S. democracy get to a stage where the two choices are a genocider and a racist? And that's why I think that the Democrat argument that democracy is under threat has, is, is, is not winning enough over, 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 those, over the general masses. I think that the, the, the battle of the narratives in Canada is a bit different from that in the U.S. In Canada, you feel like, you know, it, it's a much tougher battle. Um, certainly, there's been a lot of pressure. I remember some academics telling me that they've been pressured to take leave of absence really? from their universities in order to ensure that they wouldn't be able to talk about Palestine. Lots of events are being cancelled. Some of the universities are struggling. So if they cancel a Palestinian event, they'll cancel a Zionist event, and then there'll be backlash. There's a lot of heated discussion taking place on the university campuses. But if I had to answer your question directly, I think there's this irresistible wave that is going across America in which now more and more people are talking about the genocide, more and more people are changing their opinions with regards to the Zionist. There's a hysteria amongst the Zionists, and we see it even here in the UK, you know it as well, the idea of expanding the term of anti-Semitism to include anti-Zionism, something that many Jews adamantly reject. And I think that in terms of the general trend, I think it creates a series of opportunities to manifest the legitimate democratic rights of the citizens to punish genocide. It's also forced a discussion as to where we lack as a community and where we can improve. I think that while the community produced a lot of doctors, lawyers, and engineers, I think there's now serious discussion about how do you create political analysts? How do you create more people in the media? How do you create more people who are able to represent the community in the narratives themselves? And the final point that's worth noting is there's also much more innovation and creativity and also an assertion of the citizenship of Muslims of these countries. I think that in America in particular, I think I, I, I'm very fond of the notion that Muslims in America believe themselves legitimately so to be American. Right. They believe that they are part of the nation. They believe that they identify with the land on which they were born and they were raised. And legitimately so. Allah created the whole entire earth, didn't just create Saudi Arabia and, and, and the lands next to it. And I think that what we're seeing more is Americans or American Muslims now actively trying to assert their legitimate democratic rights in a way that is becoming increasingly effective. And that's why we're seeing innovative, creative ways to engage even with non-Muslims in pushing that influence. And I'll give an example. In Chicago, there were these billboards which said, you know, we give $3.8 billion to Israel every year and I can't afford health care. We give $3.8 billion to Israel and I can't afford the homeless. The ability to really communicate with the society and the community at large that is amplifying the threat to Biden's presidency and an awareness amongst the Muslims that they are not alone in this, that there are non-Muslims of conscience who are standing with them. But the interesting thing is that the Muslims are in a cause advocating for justice. And Allah says in the Quran, ila that when you stand for what is right, Allah increases strength to your strength. The idea being is you have your strength, but Allah will give you strength from elsewhere. In America, I feel like you're seeing the implementation of that area. Muslims moved for Gaza and all of these non-Muslim allies are coming and they're joining them and they're saying to them, we will stand with you against this genocide without necessarily the Muslims having to compromise on their values or their beliefs, but rather winning the admiration of their allies with regards to their values and their beliefs. Okay, can I, can I pick up on that? Because it's an interesting point. Um, we know that America is an empire, at least that's how some describe it. And American exceptionalism is so strong that even Muslims who arrived in America, maybe you know, in the 60s and 70s, They've adopted this exceptionalism mindset. Uh, you talk about how Muslim Americans feel that they are part of that society and they have a right to use the political levers to fight for causes like Gaza. But has the narrative moved beyond that? Has the narrative moved to Muslims actually expressing their anger with the American empire, their anger with American exceptionalism, their anger of a of a country that has wreaked havoc in the Muslim world, not for 20 years, but for probably the last 50, 60 years. Like, is there a recognition that they have a responsibility like Musa alayhi salam in, uh, in Egypt, in, in the heart of their own city, like Musa alayhi salam spoke against the, the, the structure that undermined uh, Bani Israel. Has that narrative moved to that space? I think that the reality is that I think the Muslim community in America has always been highlighting the vicious nature of the empire of America. I think that this has been going on even before 9-11 took place. And I think that 
anyone who listens to Imam Omar Suleiman's uh, podcast with Lex Friedman, he's very blunt and he repeats it constantly and he tells the Americans, but he speaks as an American. He says, we need to understand that we in America have a very vicious foreign policy abroad, yeah. that we, a foreign policy abroad is not something that we can be proud of. And, and he says that as, as an American as well. But the thing, the reason why I push back on the question slightly is because it implies the Muslim community are not doing it. Mm -hmm. I think the problem before was the Muslim community were doing it, but there was not enough non-Muslims doing it. And I think what Gaza is doing is that it's really awakened a debate within America itself, where now you have not only the Muslims calling out the empire, but you have non-Muslims also calling out the empire and saying, what are we doing? And it's coming in different shades. So if you remember, for example, during the prim Republican primaries, that uh, Ramaswamy, for example, was coming out and saying, why are we getting involved in so many wars abroad? No. Why in Ukraine? Even questioning Israel from time. Donald Trump suggested we shouldn't go to a war ab abroad for free anymore. Like, why are we getting involved in all of these affairs? Anyone who reads James Jeffrey, the US envoy to Syria, in his interview with Al Monitor, he says one of the biggest issues we had with the Trump presidency was he kept asking us why we're there. Why are we in Syria? Why are we in these places? Why can't we bring our boys home? If you look at Tucker Carlson, I don't watch Tucker Carlson. I want to go on record. I don't watch Tucker Carlson. Somebody showed me this clip, which is why I know he said this. But Tucker Carlson himself asking the question, why are we even giving money to the Israelis? The point that I'm saying is that we saw the debate expand and Democrat leftists criticize foreign policy. But we're also seeing it on the right of the Republicans. Why are we getting involved? That's why people are talking about America becoming isolationist. It's why we're seeing the debate about NATO, that NATO won't be funded by the Americans if Trump comes to power. The idea being that America is pulling back, that America is looking at this empire abroad and now discussing. And this is why I said different shades. It may not be in the same way or for the same reasons or for the same that they're criticizing it, but it's become a central debate. And Gaza has amplified that debate as well. So I think the Muslims have always been criticizing it, in, in, in my opinion, to different degrees and varying degrees. I think even those who identify as Americans, and I think most Muslims identify as Americans, the reason why I mention that is because I think there's something to learn from it in terms of how we in Britain perceive, perceive ourselves as part of the social fabric in the UK itself, particularly given that the debate on Islamophobia is designed to deny us our legitimate rights as citizens in this country. The idea of being the other, and I'm very wary of how we British Muslims speak about our position here in the UK, because I think that to suggest that we are not part of it, it simply affirms what they are trying to say about us in their ability to deny us our rights. I was born and raised in London, born and raised in Wembley. Well, there is no feeling like landing in Heathrow Airport. If I land in Tunis or I land in Algiers, where I'm originally from, it's not the same feeling as landing in Heathrow Airport where you land and you say, I'm home. And when you go to Wembley, you say, I'm home. I think that there is something to be said about this identity that does not contradict with your need and desire to stand for justice. And I think that what Gaza has demonstrated, as you yourself have been working very heavily on, and so have other people as well, the idea of how do we mobilize within our rights as citizens of this country to affect the system in a way, not that benefits us. I don't like this particular term, but rather that upholds justice. What is making non-Muslims stand with us in these issues is not the fact that we are pursuing our interests, but that we as a community are pursuing justice and therefore they are rallying around us, which is why an issue that should not have caused such a rupture in the Labour Party in Kislamah is causing such a rupture. Why? Because Allah gave everybody a fitrah and our call for justice is resonating with that fitrah. So when we mobilize for justice, those with the fitrah who resonated with the justice are now joining us in those particular efforts as well. Can I ask you, is there a contradiction between being ummatic and being British or being American? I think that one of the areas that strikes me, and I don't have a definitive conclusion on this, I think one of the areas that strikes me very strongly is well, We created you in nations and tribes. And the, 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 and the, the closest to Allah is, or the, or the, the most uh, elevated is the one who is atqaqum, closer to Allah, or the one most God-fearing. Yeah. The reason why I say this is because in this area, there's a clear suggestion that there does not necessarily need to be a denial of an affinity to a nation or state. Rather, what it should be a denial is the supremacy of that identity over the ummatic identity and the supremacy of that identity over your duty to uphold justice, even against your nation and against your tribe. I think that those are two very different distinctions. Because, for example, I can say that I am British and I can say that I grew up here. I can say that, you know, originally, ethnically, I may be Tunisian and Algerian, but that I know more about Britain and more about its customs and norms. And I'm probably more closely associated with their customs and norms than I am with Tunisia and, and Algeria. And that's the truth of the matter. Yeah. 
I can say, for example, that, you know, the British passport has protected me and that I enjoy it. And to be honest, I'm quite proud of it. I'll be honest with you. When you go around and you say, look, at the end of the day, we have recourse to the courts. We have re Islam Suela Braverman has been trying to ship off refugees to Rwanda for ages. One judge said no, and she can't do it. Go to the Muslim world and try and get to the, the judge will do what the, what the ruler tells him to do. I mean, we see it all, all the time. Like even in, even in, and, and I know it, it, it pains my heart to say it and it might unnecessarily upset people. But I remember, for example, when uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia were reconciling with each other and Erdogan kicked out the Khashoggi case from the courts. If, if someone tried to do that here in the UK, it would bring down a government. Yeah. But it's just considered normal over there. The, the reason why I say that there is not necessarily a contradiction is primarily because at the end of the day, the way I see it is that every single community has its very unique challenges. And that's why in America, for example, they're now pushing in terms of the battle how to punish Biden for genocide. You look at, for example, in Saudi Arabia, it's how to resist bin Salman's reforms. You look at Egypt, it's how to resist dictatorship. You look at the UK, it's how to establish a system of values whereby genocide does not get rewarded. Keir Starmer is of the belief that he has to support the genocide, otherwise his political career is finished. We are now mobilizing to convince the English people who, for the record, they are my in-laws, my wife is half English, and I'm, I'm married into the English uh, society. But in any case, the idea being is to tell them, listen, it's, it's not about you know, the Muslim issue per se. And the reason why I say this is I, I'm very careful when we talk about Muslim to understand what it means when we say something is a Muslim issue. Because Islam is synonymous with justice. To suggest that they can be two opposing things or two separate things is a very dangerous discourse to follow. And this is why when I'm talking about upholding the values of justice, I'm talking about them upholding the values of Islam. It's synonymous with each other. And we are trying to tell society, you cannot be a society that rewards genocide, that your system of governance cannot be one that rewards short-termism. There are values and principles that are also worth holding to. And the reason why I say that is because I think that kind of language resonates deeply with how I've read the da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in which he would go to Quraysh and say to them that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Stop abusing your neighbors, uphold your justice. He would tell them, speak to them in these languages, in the same way we're trying to speak to societies in those languages as well. So I don't think it necessarily contradicts with what is ummatic. I think rather instead, what that ayah demonstrates is our diversity, our tribal diversities, our national diversities, they are not, they, they are not, those identities are not supreme, but they result in us operating and bringing something new to the table where we can learn from each other, to know one another, take what is good from one another, address what is bad in each of those customs and culture. And that's why I think what's beautiful is, and you know, I, I mean, um, I don't mean to plug it, but one, one of the reasons why I enjoy the travel side of things in, yeah. in terms of what we do with how the travel guide is, when you go to the different Muslim communities, you can clearly see distinctions in between the Bosnian Muslims and the Uzbek Muslims and the Bajan Muslims in Barbados and the like. But you see it in a way that looks beautiful that does not necessarily contradict Islam. And this is why I think that there's something quite beautiful in it. But I think more in, from a political sense, I think what it means is, and I'll finish on this point, uh, what it means is every society and community has its very unique set of challenges. And I realized this actually recently in America where people would tell me, I, what can I do about what's happening in, you know, a country thousand? I tell them, focus on the battle that's in front of you here, which is that you are at risk that in November, a man who committed genocide might win a second term. You have the power to prevent that. Focus on that. And then if I go talk to an Egyptian, I tell him your battle is different. Ignore the battle that's happening in America. We have the left flank that's focused on that. You're the right flank. And that's why I think that when we look at the Ummah as one body, each body does something different. When you look at an army, for example, each unit of the army does something different. You don't ask the cavalry to do what you want the spearmen to do. And I think if we can appreciate that, I think that we can move more ummatic. The idea being, for example, that, and, and the clearest example is this, and I promise this is the example I'm going to finish on. What, what's going to happen in America will affect what happens in Saudi. What's going to happen in the UK will affect what happens in Europe. You think that focusing here is not being ummatic. I argue that's a narrow-minded approach. What you achieve in your battle here will have a domino effect elsewhere. And the proof is that, look, we mobilized to raise awareness for Gaza. We went on social media. And then the, the people established the Muslim vote. And the Muslim Council of Britain had its own approach to this. And we have, you know, other people trying to mobilize to move. There's a debate taking place. How do we maximize it? Then Leanne Muhammad gets, you know, in Ilford North, challenging West Street. He goes in LBC the next day and says, yes, 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 I'm pro ceasefire because I've only got a 5,000 majority. And as a then SNP, Hamza Yusuf. Hamza Yusuf, who was derided when he came to power in uh, Scotland, for example. And I admit, 
people had their discussions, their debate. I stayed out of it. I didn't get involved in it. I'm not making any conclusions about it. I'm not interested in that debate. I'll be honest. I'm, people say, how can not be interested? I'm genuinely not interested in it. But Hamza Yusuf comes to power. I honestly think as if Allah put him there specifically for Gaza. Let's be honest. Do you think Nicola Sturgeon would have put three ceasefire bills through parliament and made them vote on it? Let's be honest with each other. But Hamza Yusuf put it in and put Keir Starmer in that position that caused that fiasco in parliament. That has everybody talking about Islamophobia to the extent that the Zionists are now complaining on the James O'Brien show and saying, why is everybody talking about Islamophobia? Keep the point on anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism because we want to stifle debate on Israel by pushing anti-Semitism. The point is you can see that domino effect which results in the world watching, which affects everything else. And that's why I think going back to the question yourself, Thanks. I know that there's a philosophical discussion about what it means to have a nation identity or a tribal identity or the like. But I think that philosophical discussion emerges from what you interpret that identity to be. I interpret it as a, as a, as a geographical area where you have a series of unique tests and challenges that Allah gives specifically to you. And within this nation and tribe, I have to fight these particular. But the ummatic aspect is that Allah links all these challenges together and allows us to use the results of that battle to affect different terrains elsewhere. So, so I was going to ask you about um, your your work outside of what you do as a, as a day job. So you work with your wife on this Halal Travel Guide. And I, I suppose in my discussions with you, uh, I got from you that one of the reasons why you do that, you go to countries and you tour those countries, you bring Muslims from the West to those countries, is you want to make them appreciate our history and our culture and our ummah in a far greater, you know, almost like an anthropological sense. You want them to experience this and they want them to be close to this. Now, you know that here in Britain, there is this intense hatred that comes in particular from the right wing. I mean, the left have their own hatreds, but the right wing in particular, see, even that, even going to Bosnia and, uh, you know, exposing Muslims and young Muslims to Muslim culture, that is a denunciation of British identity, and that's unacceptable. That's where the debate seems to be moving, and you saw that in the last week, this horrendous Islamophobia debate where even the most innocuous Islamic practice, you know, going to Umrah very often or you know, is seen to be a, a sign of Islamism, a sign of 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 isolationism, of of you know, moving in in a separate direction to Britain. I mean, how do you, how do you, th there may be some Muslims, in fact, who who then look at that and say, we need to tread carefully, we need to be more careful about our relationship with international causes and and our relationship with the Ummah at large, because that may jeopardize our position here. I mean, how do you respond to that? I think that, look, the reality is that when you look at Western societies themselves, we talk about the, the idea of halal travel has always been reconnecting the memories of the ummah together. The idea being go out and see what the ummah actually looks like. Go yeah. out and see the way Bosnia have survived the Yugoslavian communism and the genocide and the Serbian war and how they came out on top. Mitterrand told Clinton, the French president once upon a time, he told Clinton, I will not tolerate a Muslim state in the heart of Europe. Well, yeah. there's a Muslim state now in the heart of Europe. Mm. The, the Bosnians, they survived all of that, even though the Serbs were backed by Russia, Croats backed by Europe, and the Bosnians were seemingly abandoned. But Allah gave them the strength. My, my aim was always to take people to see that so that they could see the Ummah is actually stronger than you think it is. But, but the reason why I, I, I mentioned this idea, you know, tread carefully, or you mentioned the idea, tread carefully. And, you know, we should be wary, you know, how we engage. And I think that one of the things that's worth noting is the Americans are everywhere. They're engaging everywhere. The UK are engaging everywhere. Europe is engaging everywhere. China is engaging everywhere. Russia is engaging everywhere. And I think in this many, in many ways, the reality is that we are one humanity. Ali bin Abi Talib said, you're either my brother in Islam or my brother in humanity. The idea being is that we are always interconnected with each other. And, and even when we look at this backlash with Islamophobia uh, that's taking place, I think at the same time, there is this push against the idea, you know, they were using the word Islamist or the like or Islamist mob that was used with regards to parliament. I think equally when you open Twitter or you open the social media, you see a lot within British society itself, non-Muslims who are coming out and saying, what on earth? I saw Nick Ferrari, Nick Ferrari Ma Adrak on LBC. Yes. For those who don't know Nick Ferrari, Nick Ferrari is known for being, he's much of the more right-wing kind of yeah. presenters. Nick Ferrari asking a conservative government minister, telling him, is what Lee Anderson said Islamophobe? No, he tells him, what did he do wrong? Because he said he, he was ill, the comments were ill-judged. And Nick Ferrari says, okay, but what did he do wrong? He said what he said was wrong. Yeah, but what about what he said was wrong? And then Nick Ferrari, you can see him get frustrated. He's like, okay, let me reword it. Was it Islamophobia? The guy doesn't want to answer. Was it Islamophobia? Was it? The point is, even someone like Nick Ferrari is saying 
this is out of order. You, you, we can't tolerate this here. You look at John Sopel, for example, the former BBC, on, on you coming out and saying this, like, they've opened uh, like a Pandora's box that should not be opened. This is horrendous. Mm -hmm. James O'Brien coming out and saying that you're saying that we're talking about anti-Semitism. We need to talk about Islamophobia as well. And this is the reason why sometimes I feel like Muslim analysis tends to focus on the problems, but does not necessarily focus on what's happening in, on, in terms of the course that that problem is taking because it shows you that within British society itself, there is an abhorrence towards ideas of racism and xenophobia in that while you may hear it being loud, there's also very loud voices against it as well. And they're doing it based on a fitra, a values and principles as well. And that's why I think when you consider that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is rahmatil alameen, is a mercy for all mankind, there's a reason he's called a mercy for all mankind. It's because the message resonates. And that's why I think it all depends on the issue of how you perceive da'wah or in what environment do you perceive da'wah. Are you somebody who believes themselves to be similar to the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who only minority are buried in Medina, the majority are buried outside of Medina because the majority interpreted Islam as going out, as going out to these new societies, as putting up with that backlash, as pushing through because they knew that Allah said, push back against that backlash, push back with that which is best. For it may well be the one who is your enemy today, tomorrow becomes your warmest ally. Allah says it in the ayah where he talks about da'wah. The full part is, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهُ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالَ إِنَّنِي مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Is there any better speech than one who calls to Allah, does good deeds and says, I am from the Muslimin. I'm doing it because I'm Muslim. The same way we do here in Britain. I'm a British Muslim. I'm doing my actions because I'm a Muslim. It's like Ezzet Begovic, the European, ethnically European. Ezzet Begovic, the Bosnian president, was asked by a European reporter during the war that you talk about a Bosnia of tolerance, a Bosnia of coexistence between Muslims, Jews and Christians because Sarajevo was called the Jerusalem of Europe because when the Muslims ruled it, it was the only city in Europe aside from Andalusia where they, where they could live harmoniously because Islam uh, affords that. As, as Ali Azad Begovic, they said to him, well, this European tolerance that you uphold and he interrupts and says, wait a minute, this is not a European tolerance. European tolerance is the Holocaust. European tolerance is the Spanish Inquisition. European tolerance is the Warsaw Pogrom. European tolerance is the genocide being committed by the Serbians against the Bosnians. My tolerance is an Islamic tolerance. I am European, but my tolerance comes from, from, from Islam as a, as a European Muslim. And when you look at the ayah that there is no better speech than one who calls to Allah, does goodies and say, I am from the Muslimin. The next ayah tells you what da'wah feels like. And this is the point I want to emphasize to Muslims. The next ayah tells you what it feels like. The good deed and the bad deed are not equal. Implying that after you give that da'wah, there is a reaction that might be negative. So Allah is telling you that those negative tactics used against you do not justify you using it for the good deed and the bad deed are not equal. Push back with that which is best for the one with whom you have an enmity today, the one Islamophobic to you today, the one racist to you today, the one shouting at you today, the one doing a hit job on you today, tomorrow might become your warmest ally. And that's why I always wonder about an ummah that reads about Amr ibn As radiallahu anhu, who goes to Abyssinia to bring the Muslims back and celebrates how he becomes the one who takes Islam to Egypt. How they say, mashallah, but cannot envisage a similar scenario in front of them today. How they can read Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu to lead an army to defeat the Muslims in Uhud, to become the sword of Allah who takes Islam elsewhere afterwards later on. They say, mashallah, to the story, but cannot envisage the situation happening like that today. Why? because subconsciously they believe the seerah to be a historical book not a modern book to be read and applied in modern terms and that's the point I say in that you are correct to highlight that there is a right wing push you are correct to highlight that there is pressure being brought to bear you are correct to highlight that there is Islamophobia but I think that if you stop there it's a half truth it's like wala taqrabu salat wa antum sukara it's like you stopping in midway through the ayah do not approach prayer when you are intoxicated it's like we have a saying in Arabic don't, don't be from the people wala taqrabu salat because if you stop the ayah here it means don't approach prayer okay. finish it there is Islamophobia and right wing, but there is also pushback to that Islamophobia and the Labour and Conservative Party are in trouble because of that racism. 
when Rishi Sunak has to apologize for it, it's because it's it's caused enough of a backlash where the prime minister is forced to comment on it. And even if he won't call it Islamophobia, it shows he's under pressure. How do I navigate it? But under pressure from who? A public that will not tolerate that sort of language or Islamophobia. And that shows you how far society has come because of the dawah that the Muslims give, a dawah that tells them, we're not here to take over the country the way these guys are claiming. We have a series of values and principles and you have freedom of speech. And we are using that freedom of speech. And this is the final point I want to say. And this is the reason why Islam is attacked in a way Buddhism and Hinduism is not. Because in freedom of speech, Islam thrives. In freedom, Islam thrives. Why? Because Islam is built on the idea of a free submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells you, La deen. you can't bring somebody and make them prostrate because Allah will not accept it. There's, Allah tells you there's no point in using force to convert somebody to Islam. You must willingly use your dialogue and convince them wholeheartedly to believe. That's why I always tell, I always believe that Islam in freedom thrives. Give me freedom of speech. Islam thrives. It's repression that Islam opposes. And that's why when you look at Gaza, who's the one doing the repression today? Who's the one doing shutting down the voices? Who are the ones canceling events to prevent debate taking place? It's the Zionists and their allies. It's the Muslims saying, give us freedom of speech because we know that in freedom, the population will see the just cause of Palestine and they will join us in the protest to denounce genocide. Now, I said at the start that I want to explore your analysis on Gaza and Sudan. Um, let's start with Gaza first. Is Netanyahu out of control and is Biden attempting to rein him in? I think that the situation as it stands is that Biden is certainly uncomfortable with what Netanyahu is doing, but not uncomfortable because there's a genocide. Mm. Biden is not uncomfortable because the Palestinians are being killed. Biden is uncomfortable because... He was told in the beginning that he would pay an electoral price for his support for genocide, but never truly believed it. And the reason Biden never truly believed it is because the UAE told him we have no problem. Saudi Arabia gave him a fatwa saying it, it's all good, no problem. We'll just tell them make dua and not talk about uh, Gaza because it's a fitna. He saw that Erdogan was more keen to keep the neutral stance or the like. Biden believed that given the Muslim nations themselves are not necessarily anti what's happening in Gaza or rather demonstrating an apathy towards what's happening. Turki Ali Sheikh, the head of the General Entertainment Authority in Saudi Arabia, announced yesterday that they're announcing uh, Anthony Joshua versus Ngano and this is going to be the fight and they're really pushing it and amplifying it as well. Biden believed that you're telling me Muslims will punish me, but their Muslim leaders are telling me that there's no real issue in terms of what's happening at all. Yeah. Biden also believed that when he engaged with some Muslim organizations in the US, they were telling him that, you know, yes, you're committing genocide, but if you show some empathy, in the words of one uh, Muslim uh, who put a tweet out, a prominent uh, presence on social media, I don't want to mention his name, but in any case, he said, you know, if if Biden can show empathy, then he can still win back enough Muslim voters, even after 30,000. The Democrats were hearing this kind of language, or Biden was hearing this kind of language, and said, okay, this shows they're not an organized block. If they were organized, they can punish me. This shows they're not an organized block. This shows there's a way back for me. Let them continue the genocide. Why? Because the fundraising that I'm doing is coming from the Zionists, and they are saying that I'm standing with Israel. I don't want to jeopardize that at all. As Biden becomes more and more concerned over his electoral chances, that's when we're seeing the frustration start to grow. The idea being that Biden now uh, tried to host, uh, sent Blinken to Cairo uh, two weeks from this recording uh, where he, they discussed and they talked about potential uh, ceasefire. Netanyahu refused to allow an Israeli delegation to join. But in the Paris discussions two days ago, or over the last weekend from this recording, Netanyahu let a delegation go. And then that delegation afterwards went to Doha. The idea being that, that the, the, the offer when it goes to Doha means it's being given to Hamas for Hamas to decide what's going to happen. So there's certainly diplomatic movement. Biden mentioned the idea that there might be a ceasefire. This might be psychological warfare to sort of, because the statement came just before the Michigan primaries, where he's worried that the uncommitted vote might, you know, cause problems for him in, in Michigan itself. I think Biden is certainly frustrated, but I don't think Biden is at a stage where he believes that the Zionist vote is worth compromising by actually coming out and seriously imposing his ceasefire, which is why even when he's isolated, he's still imposing that veto. I think that Netanyahu is certainly out of control in terms of his desire to fully annex Gaza. And if we put it, you know, from a political perspective, put yourself in his position. I, 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 I'm, I'm, it's, it's just a methodology of political analysis. But in any case, 
you entered Gaza, you've taken northern Gaza, you took Gaza City, you took Khan Yunus, and now you're on the last part, which is Rafah. You, you, you're already there, like you're on the final stage. Why stop there? This is a golden opportunity to go into Rafah and to take it and seize it and to annex Gaza and kick out the Palestinians. And you have the Western allies who are still giving you impunity. Yes, there are statements, but no real action. Yes, there are calls for ceasefire, but no real action. We're still seeing you know, a crackdown on the campuses or the like. So the idea being is that Netanyahu, from his perspective, believes, why should I stop here? Let me annex Gaza. And this is what the Israeli population will laud me for because, by, uh, because Netanyahu believes, perhaps legitimately so, that the way to win elections is to massacre Palestinians. The more Palestinians you kill, the more votes you win in Israel. The more land you take, the more votes you win in Israel. And I think when even when you look at the Israeli protests, and I've been very careful to emphasize this, that the Israelis are protesting the hostage situation, not what's happening in Gaza. I think that's an important distinction. Israelis in Israel, when they stand in front of Netanyahu and they're protesting, because I've alluded to it a few times, and some people misinterpret it as that they're protesting for what's happening in Gaza. They're not. They're protesting the idea of the hostages being still in Gaza. They're not protesting what's happening in Gaza itself. And that's why I think you still have a lot of Israelis who are, albeit there are some Israelis against Gaza, but I do think that if Netanyahu believed that he would lose an election because of Gaza, he would have stopped. He knows that that's the way he can win an election in Israel, which shows you the state of the society that is in Israel today. The point being is Netanyahu is out of control, but in some way there is a political logic to what he's doing in that if the world is not moving to prevent his genocide and not moving to prevent his ethnic cleansing, and he openly believes in this from the river to the sea, which is the Likud uh, mantra. It wasn't originally Palestinian, it was a Likud mantra in 1977 in their yeah. constitution. I know people want to make it as if it's genocide or Palestinian chant, it's actually the Israelis. But the point being, uh, it reminds me actually, uh, <laughs> I was sitting in Washington and there was a friend who said to me, uh, we were talking about how do you push back against Zionist propaganda? And he said to me, Sammy, sometimes I feel like we overthink it. Just give them the microphone. Just give the Israelis the microphone and they'll destroy their own propaganda in terms of their, their language and their rhetoric. I think Netanyahu believes this is a golden opportunity. I think the Zionists believe this is a golden opportunity. I think they believe they have the, the enduring support of Washington. And I think, and, and this is where I have a bit of regret in that I think that if the Muslims of America have been very quick to be absolutely clear that they categorically will not vote Biden because of the genocide. I think they, there was a window of opportunity to force the Democrats to change Biden as the candidate. But I think that the presence of some voices in Washington and some prominent commentators who, you know, I, I enjoy following on Twitter from time to time, but the ones who are saying, oh my God, oh my God, yes, I'm against Biden, but Trump is going to be worse, Trump is going to be worse, Trump is going to be worse. I think that sort of rhetoric made Biden feel like, listen, let me continue supporting. I think the final point that's worth noting here is, I think that although Biden might feel that the electoral threat is not great, that doesn't mean the electoral threat is not great. There is certainly a suggestion that I believe that Biden is not aware of how bad the situation is for him electorally. Mm -hmm. And yesterday on Reuters, it's actually interesting, the campaign manager for Biden came out and said, according to Reuters, or one of his campaign team, they said, we've come to realize the problem is far greater than we anticipated. The suggestion being that Biden is in a bubble and so is Blinken, that they've refused to believe that they could possibly lose a November election over Gaza. The reason why I wanna make this distinction is this, that when people hear that Biden doesn't believe he will lose in November, people might feel like that means their efforts were useless. No, the efforts are working. It's shifting American public opinion. It's creating a de facto situation where Biden will lose, even if Biden doesn't appreciate it yet. And that's why I wanna make that distinction. It's not that Biden will not suffer for genocide. Biden believes he will not suffer, but he's mistaken in that belief. And that's why he's very interested in what happens in Michigan. In that I know some people are saying that the results weren't what were expected. But if you actually look at the numbers, and I looked at the numbers just before I came in, there's a, the, num the latest numbers I saw was there's at least 100,000 who voted uncommitted. 100,000 was the swing, you know, in, in, that, in, in that state. Which means there are 100,000 suggesting they will not vote for Biden when the elections come in November. And that's going to cause alarm bells in the Democrat. And that might actually force the change itself. The f final thing, although I said final thing, but the final thing also worth noting is don't forget the ICJ proceedings. Yes. All these countries are lining up one by one, lambasting the Israel. And Germany withdrew from the case as well, saying, I don't want to be part of this case as well. And the countries are lining up one by one to confirm this settler colonialism that's taking place. And Blinken talking about the idea that settler colonialism, that the, the, the settlements are contradicting international law. That in and of itself suggests a break with 
previous rhetoric in which the Americans used to defend those settlers. I'm not saying that these are major victories. I'm saying these are reflections or th they reflect a changing position that is taking place as a result of uncertainty. And that uncertainty is being brought about by the efforts of ordinary grassroots. And that's why I think that the situation is changing. There's talks about a ceasefire. Whether it will come about or not in, 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 in the near future is difficult to ascertain. What's certainly clear is it's the Americans and the Israelis who are panicking more than the Palestinians are. I mean, by Palestinians, I mean the Palestinian political factions. Because for the Palestinian factions, they believe the narrative has shifted in their favor. But we ask, you know, genocide is not easy to talk about in any case. So yeah. we ask Allah to make it easy. So from your understanding, from your analysis, and it, it, it makes a lot of sense, Biden is really being moved by his electoral chances rather than any disdain he may have for genocide or ethnic cleansing. And, and in many ways, the plan of Netanyahu and Biden are, they're at one when it comes to uh, the, the genocide of, of, of Gaza. It's just how and at what intensity and how that's going to have a, potential problem for him uh, domestically. So if, if that is if that is an acceptable uh, premise to start from, um, can I ask then about the question that's asked by everyone, actually, when, when we raise the issue of abandoned Biden, and that is um, Trump. Now, of course, you know, the discussion about Trump is going to be worse is, is one discussion. But on the issue of Gaza, there is really no difference. I mean, if, if Trump was the president at this moment in time, I suspect Trump wouldn't even be thinking about talking, at least tonally, trying to talk against Netanyahu's most extreme policies. And we know it's all fabricated and nonsense, but, you know, Trump would be egging him on, I suspect, and, and wouldn't have no problem with the genocide. And, you know, he's he would be pretty open about the inhumanity or the, the dehumanizing of, of, of Muslims in, in, and Palestinians in, in Gaza. So from a, from a you know, it's a two-party system. Abandoning Biden is only going to replace Biden with Trump. How do you answer that really specific claim on Palestine rather than the sort of the other issues, the banning Muslims from traveling, whatever? How do you address that? I believe that politics is a science of human relations. Mm. Politics is not a science of systems. It's a science of human relations and systems are the outcome of those human relations. The reason why I start with the premise of human relations is to highlight two points. The first thing is that one of the reasons why I'm uncomfortable with that discussion is, is because you are talking, you are neglecting what actually happened to talk to me about hypothetical. A judge in a courtroom will not condemn the one who might commit a genocide. He will condemn the one who committed a genocide. That's the first point. Well, let's focus on the one who committed the genocide, not the one who might commit a genocide, because we don't know what the environment or the situation might be. It may well be that Trump might not even commit a genocide. I'm not defending Trump here. What I'm saying is, it's important to look at the facts that are before you first and foremost. A genocide was committed by Genocide Joe. I'm not saying Genocide Joe supported, I'm saying he committed it because he allowed it to happen and he actively supported and he gave arms. In the words of Joseph Borrell, the EU foreign policy chief, he said, you keep saying you're against what's happening in Gaza. How does that make sense when you keep giving them weapons? Like, it makes no sense. Your words don't align with the actions. Muslims survived four years of Trump, in the words of Hind Maki. 30,000 Palestinians did not survive four years of Biden. So you're talking about hypothetical graves. I'm showing you 30,000 graves. That's the first point I want to highlight when people talk about what Trump might do. You don't look at 30,000 graves and then say to yourselves, ah, the 30,000 is a lot, but let me calculate how much number that guy might be able to make. I don't want to put a hypothetical from that regard. The second point that is worth noting is that Politics is the science of human relations. Do you think that when Joe Biden loses, inshallah, that when Joe Biden loses in November, do you think, Ya Jalal, he's going to go home and say, Alhamdulillah, at least Trump is in power, at least the politics is going to stay the same with regards to Israel? Do you think that Biden walks out of the White House having lost to Trump and says to himself, Phew, the system is the same. Israel is going to be, no, Biden is going to go home feeling so humiliated that he goes down in history as a one-term president. He will go home thinking, how could I have done things differently? Was Israel worth ruining the future of my political career? Was Israel worth compromising my second term? He will ask the opposite questions of what you're asking. The reason why I say this is because if that's Biden's reaction, what will be the reflections of the Democrats? 
Will they say, thank God the system is the same. Thank God Trump is going to do the same that we're going to do in Israel. Thank God Israel is safe even though we lost. No, they're going to say, was Israel worth losing? Was Israel... The point is there will be a political momentum reflection that will take place that has the potential to maximize and amplify into something that can shift the political language and rhetoric in American society. The point being is that when you punish a US president for a position of genocide, the next president looks at him and says, he fell because of Gaza. He didn't fall because of the economy. He fell because of Gaza. I don't want to fall because of th this situation. I will think twice as a result. I'm not saying that's what Trump will do. I'm saying that's what the discussion amongst American politicians will be. And I always give the example, what makes the Zionist lobby so successful in America? It's not that the Zionist lobby deliver candidates. If, it was all they, if all they could do was deliver candidates, then the candidate would win and betray the Zionists. Like the way that Bush did when the Muslims delivered him in Florida and gave him that swing that he needed. The reason why Bush was able to turn on the Muslims so easily after 9-11 is because he knew the Muslims could not punish him. The Zionists can punish a candidate. They throw 20 million into a swing state to try to topple Rashida Tlaib, for example, because she keeps talking about Palestine in Congress. They'll throw millions at Ehlan Omar. They might not have an alternative candidate, but they'll be like, we won't let you stay in power. And that's what fears the candidate. This is the first time Muslims have power. And I always give this example, albeit it's a bit comedic, but, but I think it, it helps people to make sense. When a congressperson goes to visit a masjid today, for example, a congressperson knows about the Jewish holidays and they know about the African-American you know, milestones because African-Americans and the Zionists are the two minorities that have the power to punish candidates. Muslims have never shown that power. So because Muslims don't have that power, usually when the congressperson visits, they don't visit because they want to win the Muslim vote. They visit because the imam asked them to come. So they'll be like, okay, fine, how can we win over these Muslims? You know, they'll look at their phone and they'll be like, you know, give me something that will make the Muslims go wow. So they'll be like, okay, on the way in the car, they don't research before, they research on the way. The secretary will look on the thing and he'll be like, how to make Muslims go wow. And then they'll look, they'll see, like, say, they have a saying, it's us, uh, the way, uh, what's his name, that former health minister here in conservatives? Oh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, how could I forget his name? The COVID one who messed up on COVID. So it, uh, it uh, Bubarak, wasn't it? No, no, the, 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 in, in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he went in the mosque and he made that blunder. Do you remember yeah. when he said, as salam as salam as salam Yeah, yeah. So I can't remember, I can't believe I've forgotten his name. But in any case, so, uh, you know, when he's doing the secretary, the secretary's look, he's like, you know, as salam alaikum, they have that greeting. So he thinks, okay, I'm going to go wow them by saying their greeting. Yeah. So he'll stand up and be like, as salam alaikum, you know, like kind of thing. And Muslims will be like, you know, they'll clap, they'll be like, thank you for trying, you know, it's actually as salam alaikum, and that kind of thing. Matt Hancock. Matt Hancock. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot his yes. name. In any case, Matt Hancock. So Matt Hancock, for those who don't know, went to a masjid, mm -hmm. and it's really, uh, you know, I applaud him for trying. I won't lie. I'm not, I'm not here to, to deride him and stuff. But mm. when he opens the sheet, you know, he tries to read as salam and he struggles to read it. Mm. One of the reasons he struggles to read it, in my opinion, is that he realizes the Muslim vote is an addition, but it's not really like an important one. He won't make that mistake when he goes to the other minorities that make a difference. Yeah. So right now, because the Muslims don't have the ability to punish, they, you know, Congress people, they make mistakes with as salam alaikum. They make mistakes. You say, as salam alaikum, Mubarak Eid and, and that stuff. And then they go, they go. Imagine if in American society there's a precedent where as a result of the genocide in Gaza, the Muslims and their allies went and punished the sitting US president, even though it was going to bring Donald Trump to power. They said, listen, we would rather vote based on principle and value than short-termism. Imagine the shift that does where a congressperson suddenly says, listen, I need to go to these masajid. I need to visit them because these guys show that they can topple a sitting US president. That congressperson will not only be able to say assalamu alaikum when he turns up, he might turn around to you and say, you know what, Muhammad, you know, Jalal, you know, we got a tough road ahead of us. You know, as long as we stay pure of heart, we can achieve it. It's like Cause being I, in America. Because the Prophet Muhammad said, and you know, the road might be tough, but as it says in the Quran, <laughs> the, the point is, why does they know this thing? Because it shows that they have power, the ability to punish the, the Muslims. And that's why I think that when you're talking about Trump, you're talking about what ifs. I'm talking about what happened. I'm telling you what happened here. You're telling me what ifs. This is why I always say, and, 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 and I know some people might be upset with this example, but I want to finish it on this example so people understand it. Mm. I believe that when you read the seal of the Prophet Muhammad when he fought Badr, he didn't know Uhud was coming. When he fought Uhud, he didn't know Khandaq was coming next. When he was in Khandaq digging the trench, he didn't know Hudaybiyah was coming next. When he signed Hudaybiyah, he didn't know the next year he'd be entering Mecca. 
The point is, the seerah is chapter by chapter by chapter. Our chapter here is about a president who committed genocide and the Labour Party that continues to support genocide and believes that's the way it can come to power. Some people are saying, but conservatives all support genocide. Mm. I'm like, the reason we're focusing on Labour is because we want to show that you can't get to power through genocide. Mm. That's it. The conservative is fine. Like we deal with them, we know what they are. But Labour are trying to say we get to power through genocide. Yeah. And that's the point that I want to make here is, I'm not saying that the next four years are going to be rosy. I'm saying that the next four years are going to be difficult irrespective of who wins, whether it's Biden who commit genocide or Trump. In that case, I can't choose to have an easy four years. So that choice is out of my hands. I need to look at the next stage. So what choice do I have? Do I have the ability to change the debate in American society regarding genocide and red line? Yes. I can make it so that Americans know, the American society, I can establish a precedent that genocide ruins your political career. I can establish a precedent that it destroys your political career. At least that is better given I don't have the choice of who can come into power like me. But not only that, to put it more simply, I always tell people that the next four years will be tough. But your choice really is, do you want to live those four years in dignity or humiliation? Do you want people to say that you are a people of dignity, that you stood on principle and you punished genocide, Joe, you punished what actually happened, and then you make preparations to resist Donald Trump in terms of what he's going to do with your legal teams and with your you know, analysis and media and narratives and developing the alliances? Or do you want to live four years in humiliation where the American political class, they say that Zionists stand up for Israel and they throw everything to defend Israel, that the African-Americans defend African-Americans, they throw their resources to defend their interests, when the Muslims, you can kill 30,000 in Palestine and they still come back to you because they're worried about a Muslim ban in the comfort of four bedroom homes. Mm. And that's the point that I want to make is, I appreciate I didn't answer the point about how do we reconcile what Trump, I think Trump is a looming threat and problem that there needs to be a serious discussion how to push back on it. I think, and I'm going to say something controversial, it sounds quite blasphemous to say to Americans, I think that Muslims should start reaching out to evangelicals and Republicans to try to find ways in which we can communicate with them, at least to try to temper the worst of Trump. I always give the example, if you remember Jalal in July, when the Muslim parents in Michigan, they denounced the LGBT in the schools and they did the protests in front of them. Yeah. I, saw, I don't know if you've seen it, the Fox News coverage of the protests. Yeah, it was very positive. The Fox yeah. News was like, look at these Muslims, they stand out with them. It shows that there are ways in which you can, there's a sheikh in East, uh, on the East Coast, he said me something very interesting. He said like there was an evangelical priest who used to praise Zionism and praise Zionism. And then the, the Muslim imam went and said to him, do you know what Zionists say about Jesus Christ? Mm. And then they showed him you know, about what they say about Mary, uh, about Maryam alayhi salam. You know, like, horrific things that they say about Jesus. Man. And he said, I found the evangelical like deeply troubled by it. The point is sometimes I feel like we underplay the role of da'wah politically. Yes. We underplay the sections of the seerah that we don't, let me choose my words wisely. I was about to say we don't like, but that's not what I mean. And I'll give the example so people understand what I mean. We read that the Prophet ﷺ during the Hajj season, the first 13 years, would go to each tent of the tribal leaders who'd come to, for anybody who would hear his message. And Quraysh would laugh at him. The Prophet's dignity was not diminished in any way when he did that. And that's why I think that the reality is that when I look at Tucker Carlson, and Rama Shwami and other guys talking about why we're we supporting the Israelis, that shows there's a debate amongst the right wingers at least of people questioning the role of Zionism or the like. And, and, to, and to summarize this particular point, and I'll finish on this point, one of the fascinating things that I found about the way the Zionists are losing their control or their ability to influence their allies was when Eli Cohen, the Israeli foreign minister, went to the EU to present his plan of the artificial island to put the Palestinians on. Because both the 27 member states and Eli Cohen were both horrified in that meeting. The EU member states were horrified that they were sitting in a meeting where Eli Cohen was presenting an artificial island to put Palestinians in. Eli Cohen was horrified that they were horrified. He was horrified. He was like, when did you guys start questioning us? When did you start questioning what we're doing? When did you guys start, you know, asking us about this and ask us about that? And I think given that Republicans are also doing it as well, I do think that in the spirit of Dawah, I'm not saying go out and support Trump. Not at all. Like, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is politics is a science of human relations. In the same way that Biden you know, will not leave office and say, Hamdir, the system's in place. That's why I always argue when Muslims tell me the system stays the same. I'm like, do you think Biden views it in those terms? Do you think Blinken views it in those terms? Do you think Kamala Harris is sitting there thinking, and he says, they don't. Because they know that the punishing of Biden will have an impact on the politics. And I want Muslims to appreciate that as opposed to the macros. Okay, so that's really interesting because, of course, there is a qualitative difference between Biden and Trump. I mean, it's wrong to say that 
their policy remains, you know, static and similar. In fact, there is now a gulf between the Republican right and the Democrats, in particular towards foreign policy and, and this anti-globalism agenda. And, and I think the Republican right is moving quite decisively in the, in the direction of sort of uh, uh, almost deserting the last 60 years of American foreign policy and coming to a, a different polit foreign policy standard uh, and, and a standard that may actually bring down the U.S. empire, at least weaken the U.S. empire, at least that's what uh, some American commentators suggest. So uh, if I was reading between the lines, your suggestion here is that if we were to look at the Sierra as a, uh, or at least part of the Sierra as political dower, you know, it's in our interest to make sure that the American empire does uh, continue that rot that Trump represents. Is, am I going too far there? I think that, look, in my opinion, the Muslim, here's something, to be honest, my, people always tell me what books did you read for politics or the like. And to be honest, I, I shouldn't underplay the fact that I had a teacher. And, you know, my father was, was my greatest teacher and remains. So I always tell people, if you're impressed with my political analysis, you haven't met the big boss. And, and you met him, mashallah. I had a chance to meet him. You had a chance to meet him. Yeah. So my father used, altered my view of da'wah. And he said the Muslim should always hope for good. The Muslim should always hope for what is good for society in general. Yeah. Not just the Muslim society, but societies in general. Yeah. The Muslim's preference should always be that people become guided, not that people should go to hellfire. The Muslim should always pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless this ummah and bless our tongues to convince people of the goodness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Islam. Yeah. That it is dearer for the Muslim that a society enters Islam rather than that society to be destroyed. Mm. And the, the reason I say this is even when you look at Nuh alayhi salam, and it's true that we have, you know, prophets, they get frustrated and they say, Allah just destroy these people. There's no hope for them. And Allah does destroy some people as well. But that's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to decide what to do with them. The prophets are said to give da'wah until their last breath or until Allah tells them otherwise. Nuh alayhi salam makes his lamentation. Rabbi inni da'utu qawmi layla wa nahara. Allahumma, I've called my people day and night. Well, let me zidhum du'ai illa firana. When I call them, they run away from me. And he, and, and, and he continues to lament. But he doesn't stop giving it because Allah hasn't told him to stop giving it. He only stops giving when Allah commands him to. I interpret from that that Allah, unless Allah tells you otherwise, our da'wah should be consistent. And that's why I went back earlier to the idea of, you know, these Muslims who say they are American or the, or the, or the, or the Muslims in Britain who say they are British, like, like myself. The idea being is that what is dearer? Now I look at my daughter, for example, Selma. Selma has English blood that runs through her veins. Selma's grandmother is not Muslim. Sel uh, sorry, Selma's great grandmother is not her grandmother Muslim. Her great grandmother is not Muslim. Mm -hmm. Selma has uh, great aunts who are not Muslim. When I look at Selma and Selma shares the blood relation with them, you cannot tell me that Selma's you know, dream or desire is to see these people destroyed. Rather she wants, I met for example, uh, Imam Suhaib Webb and he said something very interesting. Now, Imam Suhaib Webb, you know, a man who entered Islam, went out, learned Arabic, learned the Hadith, learned the Quran. In a way, that, let's be honest, Arab Muslims don't do. Like, Bismillah, mashallah, But I remember he made a remark while I was sitting with him and he said, you know, when I go back to my family, and many of his family members are still not Muslim yet. But you can see on his face that he desperately wishes that they were. Desperately wishes. And I think the reason being, that is the, the attitude of the Muslim. Mm -hmm. And that's why when, when, when people want to mention is that, yeah, Trump will ruin the American empire, that may will be, well be the political analysis of what happens. But I think the focus of the Muslim community in America and the focus of the Muslim community here in Britain is to show them how Islam is what will guide them from dhulumat ila nur. That Islam is going to benefit you. We keep talking about what we see on the tube lines. If you see harassment of a woman, report it. And we make the jokes, hashtag creeping sharia. But the reason we're saying hashtag creeping sharia is, in reality, what we're saying is, you're now seeing the good of Islam and we celebrate that you're implementing it. You're now seeing the good of the way we treat the woman and we're celebrating that you're implementing it. And we want to encourage that. And that's why I think that political analysis can sound crude. Trump will come to power. America will retreat. It will open up opportunities for Erdogan, for the Muslim state. And that may well be true in political analysis. That doesn't necessarily mean it will provide good for the Ummah, to be honest. Like, because at the end of the day, I don't know if more autonomy for bin Salman will be good for the Ummah or more autonomy will be good for bin Zayd. That's not the point. And that's why I think that that attitude may be good for analysis, but not in terms of attitude, in terms of how we proceed with regards to the Americans. And, and, the, and, and I'll summarize it with this particular point. Let's be honest. We thought that we could not convince people to abandon Zionism to support the Palestinians. We thought the Zionists were too strong, that they dominated. 
But Justin Trudeau, two days ago, comes out and he goes, he laments that social media has now surpassed mainstream media. But why does he lament it? He laments it because mainstream media, which used to control the narrative, no longer has the control. And now it means that the Palestinian narrative has broken through that monopoly, that chokehold that they imposed. But what is Justin Trudeau worried about? He's not worried about that phenomenon. He's worried about what that phenomenon is producing, which is ordinary Canadians, non-Muslims, who were Zionists yesterday or Palestinian, bro Palestinian today. What he's worried about is when you open up the freedom for people to talk and present their opinions, he's worried that the freedom, which is the essence of their values, is benefiting the da'wah is benefiting the Muslim cause in terms of getting people who are non-Muslims to now sympathize with it. I went to Sacramento in, 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 in uh, California, and I remember in, in, the, in, the, in the Muslim center where I was giving my talk, there is a Jewish candidate who is running who came and said, I, I as a Jew, I denounce this genocide, and I'm running it, and I want you guys, please, I promise, like, well, let's work together against it. It was so humbling to watch it. Why? Because it showed that the fitra resonates with what is right and that it can be done. The, the point that I'm saying is that the reason why I push back against the framing is because if your question is, if Trump comes to power, what will happen to America? I will say to you that American influence will, you know, start to, you know, be brought back, you know, and, and, and American truth will withdraw and that kind of thing. If your question is whether it's good or not, I'll be honest with you, I don't know because an opportunity doesn't mean you take it. Those who are left behind in that vacuum, it doesn't mean they'll take it. Obama didn't do anything in Syria, civil war. Obama intervened the NATO in Libya, civil war. The dynamics of each issue have their own very unique specific dynamics, which is why I push back when you said to me about the system remains the same. I, the reason I say symptoms are consequences, they're not the base. The norm is human relations. Systems emerge from that. That's why systems are constantly changing. But the point I want to make, and I'll finish on this particular point, is this idea that when we're looking in terms of the Muslim attitude, in terms of moving forward, if now on Palestine we show that when we raise our voices for Gaza and show what's happening and we hold our ground and we insist on the justice, the ones who are our enemies yesterday became our allies today. The ones who were Zionists yesterday became Palestinian today, which shows there is an environment conducive in these societies where our da'wah can have an impact. I know people criticize Hamza Yusuf, Sadiq Khan, and these people all the like, but the reality is that you might think of them as rather deformed versions of representation of the Muslim community. And that may well be the case in many years, 100% it's true. And I'm not here to defend anything that they do. What I'm here to say is this, why is it that the Muslim looks at it and wants to tear it down because he says that doesn't represent me in the way that I demand that they represent? And why does the right winger instead look at it and say that 20 years ago there was no Muslim representation? Guys, this is dangerous. There's a trajectory that is happening. If today it's Sadiq Khan, tomorrow it's Hijabi. If today it's Hamza Yusuf, tomorrow it's this. Why does the right winger believe the trajectory is leading to a greater spread of the da'wah, but the Muslim believes that the da'wah is deformed. And this is why I find it quite fascinating when Muslims talk about politics generally, in that when you hear the other side, they see Islam as an irresistible force. When you talk to the Muslims, they tell you it's a waning force or they tell you, and that's what I find quite fascinating, which is why I prefer, and this is why I know it's, I say it semi-jokingly, but you know, I always say sometimes that Netanyahu believes in the power of Allah more than many Muslims do. Right. And, and, and Blinken believes in the power of Allah more than most Muslims do. Because they're aware that the Ummatic identity and the Muslims are getting stronger every day because their da'wah is getting stronger. But, and, and, and I promise this is the final point I'll say. Why do they believe it's getting stronger? Not because of the material aspects, because Islam wins hearts and people don't leave Islam after they've entered it. Paul Williams, the English reaver, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, those Megan Rice who was on TikTok first two weeks of Gaza and then became Muslim after what happened in Gaza. That girl in LA who does the video says I was Zionist and I grew up Zionist and now all my TikTok videos, I checked her account yesterday, she's still doing every day on, on Palestine or the like. What they're worried about is the power of Islam is not necessarily in its material capabilities. That's a consequence, not a cause. The power of Islam is what was demonstrated in the first 13 years of life of the Prophet Sallam, in that it wins hearts in such a way that people abandon the material power to enter Islam itself. So you're saying GB News is, is, is profound. <laughs> A profound station. Is that what we're saying now, Sammy? I, I'm saying that, that even GB News, even the phenomenon, and, and this is why I think that, you know, GB News is saying that we're, we're identifying a trajectory whereby the British identity is changing and that the British identity is beginning to encompass more than just the white English person. And they are concerned about that. But that debate in and of itself, what does it mean to be British? I'm not saying that's a debate Muslims, you know, necessarily, you know, should spend day and night thinking about it. 
I'm saying that the reason they're having that debate is because as the da'wah grows, people are having to ask, okay, these are British people here. They believe in Islam. How does that fit within our society? And I think that debate in and of itself is a chance for Muslims to demonstrate that we didn't come here as a curse. We came here as a mercy. So let's go back to uh, the geopolitics. Your assessment the last time we met was uh, came out to be broadly true that Iran would not escalate the crisis, but actually would keep a lid on some of its assets in the region, uh, save a few tokenistic moves on the border of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Lebanon and Israel. Uh, however, there has been a market change in the way the Houthis have acted. They've disrupted and continue to disrupt the trade uh, trade in, in the Red Sea. And um, we've had, of course, US uh, and UK military action against them. Uh, at this point, do you think the Houthis are working autonomously to, to, to that of uh, Iran? I understand the question distinguishes between the Houthis and Hezbollah. But it is worth noting, and I'm not taking anything away from the Houthis. I, I do believe that the Houthis have made a difference in terms of what's happening. I'm not taking that away from them. Yeah. Albeit, people know my reservations about the Iranians. And, you know, I see sometimes in the comments, people like whenever he talks about the Shia resistance, he... It's not that, it's, as I said, I just believe that Iran's proxies have killed more of the Sunnah than Israel have killed Palestinians. But it's important to, to you've used the term Shia resistance. I mean, I, I notice you don't use that term normally. You talk about Iranian resistance. They, they say, they, they use the term Shia, yeah. so I adopted their terms. But, but there is this argument that you are deeply sectarian. Uh, I mean, do you want to address that? It's not about whether I want to address it or not. I, I always think that after the Saddam regime fell in Iraq, I do think that the Shia parties or the pro-Iran parties, if we're going to be more accurate, mm. because, you know, I grew up with the likes of, you know, there was a famous Iraqi poet, Dr. Abbas al-Janabi, mm. who was Shia and anti-Iran, right. like very much anti-Iran. And he was phenomenal in my development, my own Arabic language. Allah, yarahmu, he passed away, mashallah. Like he was a very, you know, big influence, like on my life and on my upbringing as well. So if you look at, you know, other Shia as well, they are against. That's why I always use the, the Iran, Iran proxies. Yeah. I don't use the Shia yeah. resistance. They say whenever Sami talks about Shia resistance, I'm not talking about Shia resistance. No. I'm talking about Iran and what Iran is doing. Yeah. Because Iran also persecute Shia who aren't uh, allied with Iran. Yeah. I always argue that uh, when the Saddam regime fell, the pro-Iran parties had the chance to show us what their rule looks like. Mm. And it ended up sectarian. Yeah. They ended up going to Diyala and you know, kicking out a lot of the Sunni population. When they went to Mosul, they unfurled those banners where they take revenge for us. They showed us what it looks like. And, and that's the reason why I think that they don't have a moral leg to stand on when they do. You look at Syria, for example, and I admit that Syria, this is going to sound controversial. I, I think that Syria was not as ready for a revolution. I do think that although Syria had the elements of a revolution, I think the Qataris got overexcited, you know, after what happened in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and the like. Qataris got overexcited. They thought they had the carte blanche from the Americans to do what they wish, and they really, you know, tried to force it. And that's why I think that there was a lot of, I always say this, the Assad regime, the people wanted to topple it to have the right to choose their own leaders. That doesn't mean the Americans didn't want to topple it. The Americans also wanted to topple it for different reasons as well. I don't think that discredits the legitimacy of the Syrians wanting to topple the Assad regime, but I'm not denying the American role in it. I'm just saying that it's not the Americans who caused the crisis in Syria. I think it was the zulm and oppression of Bashar al-Assad. Umar, we have the maxim in Islam, Umar bin Abdul Aziz, anhu, the fifth of the right Gladi caliphs, considered the fifth of the right caliphs, mm. he receives a letter from one of his governors. And the governor says to him, I need more reinforcements to keep these unruly tribes in order. You know, hassanha. He uses the word hassanha. Umar bin Abdul Aziz writes a letter back refusing reinforcements and says, hassanha bil adl. Fortify it with justice. Don't fortify it with reinforcements. Fortify it with justice. Keeps it. I think, you know, dhulm leads to oppression. Assad's oppression led to it. But, but going back to the point with regards to the Houthis and Hezbollah, I think the Iranians ma have maximized what they're going to do, which is missiles on the Lebanese border, missiles in the Red Sea, no response from Syria because Assad is focused on bombarding Idlib and taking, trying to take Idlib and try to push the Turks uh, out. It, Assad wants to restore his authority with the help of the Russians and the Iranians. I think that the Iranians, as was said in that Reuters article, it was said that Haniyeh, the Hamas Poland Bureau went to the Iranians and said, we want more assistance. The Iranians said, you didn't consult us. So we're not giving you more assistance than we're actually giving. I think the Houthis in the Red Sea are very encouraged by the reaction of the Muslim world to them. Now, no one talks about their coup, their seven wars. No one talks about, you know, the carnage they wreaked on Yemen, you know, over the past nine years. Everybody's now focused on what they're doing for the sake of Gaza. In many ways, I understand the admiration in that 
the Houthis were on the verge of signing a deal with the Saudis to recognize their authority. They, they had humbled the Saudis. In political interest terms, they, they didn't need to get involved in this. You know, they, they, they could have just ignored it and, and benefited. They chose to compromise that for the sake of Palestine Gaza. And I believe they truly believe for the sake of Palestine Gaza. But to answer your question directly, I think we've seen the maximum of what Iran is willing to do. And I think that Iran has communicated to the Americans and the Americans and to the Iranians that this is the status quo that we... Iran is saying, please, guys, let's get a ceasefire quickly. But the Americans are assured that the Iranians won't escalate as, as much as... And that's why sometimes when people say that the resistance, you know, has made an impact, they call it, you know, محور المقاومة, the, 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 the resistance axis. I always say, look, I understand the desire to uh, lord the resistance. But we have to be brutally honest as well. Israel is now near Rafah. They've, they've, they've entered, like they're now near Rafah. Yeah. It's like the final stage. So this resistance hasn't succeeded in pushing the Israelis back. Okay, casualties here, casualties there, bit of mental health issues for some of the Israeli soldiers or the like. But in the overall th scheme of things in terms of militarily, like they're on Rafah and now CC appears to be building something on the border to receive those Palestinians. And, and, and Biden, his rhetoric is all, I just need a plan, what you're gonna do with the civilians? And they're trying to drive them across that border as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, with regards to Iran, Iran has done the maximum it's willing to do. And I think Iran is hoping that that pressure will try to push for a ceasefire. But I think the primary driver of a ceasefire will be public opinion, not necessarily what the Iranians are doing. But nevertheless, the Houthis have, have made an impact and they've humiliated the other Arab regimes because when you use, you know, subpar weapons that you, you know, homemade to make that difference, you know, I saw, uh, I think it was Al Jazeera, they were comparing Israel's multi-million pound missile to, you know, like a cheap, you know, you know missile made by the Houthis themselves and shows all the disruption that they can you know, impact on the Red Sea. I think, yes, the Houthis have done something, but I think on the overall scheme of things, I think Iran is at its maximum. And and the rest of the Muslim rulers, the Arab rulers, Turkey, uh, we've really not seen very much more from them since we last spoke. I mean, do you feel that uh, the Americans are pretty uh, happy and content that there is really not going to be any substantial action from the Muslim world? I think Biden is certainly at ease that nothing will come from the Muslim world. Yeah. Biden is certainly at ease that Saudi Arabia is more concerned with the concerts and, and, and everything that's taking place uh, inside, that the UAE is more focused on Somalia, more focused on Sudan, on Libya and, and, and these issues. I think that the UAE made some concessions. It, it reduced some of its relations with China and Russia in exchange for getting itself lifted. So for those who don't know, UAE was put on a gray list for money laundering because of its ties with Russia. And so there's a suggestion that the UAE you know, it canceled some contracts with China to try to appease the US to get its name lifted and it was lifted about two days ago. But the point is, I think that for the Biden administration, and I say this, and I know I get criticized for it, but I, I put it quite bluntly, I think Biden is convinced that Saudi UAE at least, they are in the Zionist camp wholeheartedly. And I think it was interesting to hear Biden say, when he was uh, licking the ice cream, he said that, you know, the, the Muslim nations are saying to us, you know, that they're, no, he was saying it to Seth uh, Myers in his uh, talk show. He said, you know, that the Muslim nations are telling us that, you know, that they're ready for the next stage, which is, you know, to recognize Israel, to work with them. And I think that means he, he's getting reassurances from those Muslim nations that we're ready to recognize. I don't think Erdogan necessarily is doing. I think Erdogan is more focused on, you know, NATO ratification of Sweden in exchange for, you know, fighter jets. And, but everybody's all focused on their own thing. So I don't think Biden is concerned about any motion, any movement from the Muslim world. Having said that, I do think that Muslim leaders are concerned by Muslim public opinion. So if you notice two weeks ago, the Saudi Arabia came out with a statement in which they changed the language. So before they were saying, we will recognize Israel in exchange for a pathway to recognition of a Palestinian state. Then they came out two weeks ago and they said, we will not recognize Israel unless there's a recognition of a Palestinian state. So people thought this was a move forward by the Saudis. But it's important to look at that statement in context. In that week, the Israeli channel had come out and said that Saudi is part of a land bridge to bypass the blockade of the Houthis. And Muslim social media went, viral on it like it went mad i think there was even a thinking muslim cut you guys you got millions of, of views to, we're talking about bin salman's thing yeah it was under that pressure so the point i'm saying is that statement is not directed at biden or the israelis the saudis are assuring biden and the israelis that normalization is still on the cards that statement was directed at me and you to tell us look here's a statement now please just be quiet it's because you know hoping the words and, and and it's true i saw some people coming out on twitter some imam saying this is the saudi position You're like yeah there's a difference between what they're saying and what they're doing there's a difference between what they're saying and between having Jared Kushner coming to you know, talking at a Saudi forum. He was in Florida. They did this investment in Saudi forum. Jared Kushner again was the keynote speaker. This is two weeks ago. 
So they're giving you words on one hand and the actions are saying something different. But to answer your question directly, I don't think they're worried about Muslim rulers doing anything. Can I ask you one final question on Gaza? And I appreciate we've done a lot on Gaza and mm. we need to move on to Sudan. But the PA, uh, the Palestinian Authority, um, there is some discussion about how, uh, I mean, historically, I think it's it's not uncontroversial to say that the PA is, has really betrayed the, the Palestinian movement. I think, I think that's widely accepted. But there is a, a discussion about how, why the PA has remained quite placid, even in the face of, you know, this genocide. I mean, they could have started up a separate front uh, in the West Bank. At least that's a discussion that some Palestinians are having. Um, how do you assess the, the status of the PA and, and its um, culpability, I suppose, in, in this crisis? I think you look at pictures of Ramallah, Israeli tanks are in Ramallah itself. The Palestinian Authority does not have the ability to resist the Israelis. I think that there was a suggestion that maybe the people in those areas would take to the streets as well. In order Intifada. Or something. Intifada. The people didn't. Mm. I think maybe the time perhaps was not right for it or the like. But certainly, if you also remember as well, is there was an Israeli buildup in the Janine refugee camp as well. Yeah. So Israeli positions were well poised to subdue the West Bank. This was preemptive. In order preemptive. To, they were yeah. already ready to subdue the West Bank itself. Mm. And I also think that consider yourself in the PA position and I'm not defending the PA I agree with you the PA are a tool used by the Israelis to suppress the Palestinians I agree wholeheartedly yeah. but let's suppose in a hypothetical situation that they are not a tool and that they have some agency if you if you're looking at what happened to Gaza do you want to bring that on yourself in Ramallah in the West Bank do you think that it is moral to bring that upon yourself in the West Bank do you think that it is heroic and brave to bring that genocide and destruction, how watching 30,000 get slaughtered in Gaza, do you think there is something heroic, brave, and noble in bringing that on yourself in Ramallah or in the West Bank itself? Do you think that it is Islamic to enter a war you know you cannot win when perhaps you might want to consider other options as well? Does Allah tell you to go to Halak, go to utter destruction, and say that that is a moral obligation to do so? The reason why I say this is an interesting story. So in uh, 1920s, 1910s, we were talking about, the, you mentioned the Ottoman state. So I always argue that the Ottoman state collapsed in 1909 when Sultan Abdul Hamid was toppled. Mm -hmm. And then the young Turks came in and, you know, the Turks always say the Arabs betrayed them. I always say the Arabs didn't betray the Ottomans, the Arabs betrayed the young Turks mm -hmm. who made it clear that the Ottoman was no longer an Islamic empire. In any case, the Sultan in 1917, 1916, he asks the Senussi movement in Libya, who are fighting the Italians that the Ottomans have abandoned Libya and left the Senussi to fight the Libyans, they asked the Senussi order to cross the border in Egypt and attack the British as part of a war. And the British are the ones allowing the supply of weapons to the Senussi because the British, they don't want to see the Italians and the French in North Africa. So they're like, listen, we don't really care much for the Senussi, but they're, they're keeping the Italians at bay. Yeah. If the weapons are going to come to them from wherever, let, the, let it come, just turn a blind eye to it, let it go. The Sunusi knew that the apathy of the, the British hatred for the Italians meant that they were turning a blind eye to the Ottomans. Sultan sends them an order and tells them, I want you to go and attack the British over a war where the Ottomans should not even have entered, you know, on the side of the Germans. They get together, the Sunusi, and they say to themselves, bluntly, if we cross the border and attack the British, they will annihilate us and they will no longer allow the supply of arms and that will ruin our ability to resist the Italians who are encroaching and coming into Libya. And another faction said, but Allah says we have to obey the ruler. The ruler has given us an order. Another says, Allah tells you don't go to halak, don't go to destruction. We, we don't have the power to beat the British like we will get annihilated. And we have the Italians in front of us. The Sultan is not taking that into consideration. And these are the young Turks. Then they're not, they're not valuing our situation. In the end, the head of the Sunusi says, my duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have to obey my Sultan. They cross, they attack the British. First week, they get some gains, they enter into Egypt, and then the British rally, and they annihilate them. And then they cut off all supply of weapons that come through the British. And we all know the story of Umar Mukhtar, who took over afterwards the Sunusi order, and how destitute the movement was against the Italians. We saw the Italian momentum. I'm not saying that the PA are anywhere, anything like the Sunusi movement, or anything like Umar Mukhtar. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that there is a legitimacy to assessing the wisdom of entering a battle that you cannot win 
and asking yourselves if the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was somebody prone to doing that or not. Because I don't think the Prophet sallallahu alayhi ever sought to willingly put Medina in jeopardy, but used to bide his time in order to build the necessary strength to do so. The reason why I went from it from that angle is not to justify the PA, but to ask people to think realistically, what are they asking the PA to do? We already knew it was a defunct organization. But do we really want the West Bank to suffer the same way Gaza has suffered? I don't have a definitive answer to this question that you posed. I'm simply throwing out thoughts and thinking out loud. As an analyst, the one thing that I love about my job is I don't need to have definitive opinions. I just need to analyze the dynamics that are in front of me. I give my receipt and I go home. Of course, I'm not asking you to pay me, but in any case, uh, as in, I, I love the job that, that lacks responsibility. I'm not responsible for it. But I do think that the West Bank, I think what is telling is that they want the Palestinian Authority to rule over Gaza. But what's also telling is that Netanyahu doesn't want the Palestinian Authority to rule over Gaza either. And there is this talk now about maybe a technocrat government that Hamas might accept a technocrat government to rule over Gaza. The UAE has an idea to impose its own puppet in Gaza, Mohammed Dahlan. He did an interview, a wide reaching interview. UAE and Egypt are suggesting that maybe they can, you know, help to impose a government and demilitarize the Palestinians as a favor to the Israelis. All those options are on the table itself. But the PA itself, I think that, look, at the end of the day, I think it's true, they betrayed the Palestinian cause. But I think on this particular issue, what did you want them to do? And I think the, the swiftness with which Israel entered Ramallah and the West Bank yeah. showed that they don't have the power really to do anything either. All right, Sammy, we've now covered Gaza. We haven't yet. It's, it's almost, we've done a podcast in itself on Gaza. We need to now move on to Sudan. I mean, uh, I've got my famous dark chocolate. Do you want to take a break and, and let's uh, have some dark chocolate and some water and dark, come back and discuss <laughs> today? Allah, sure. Please remember to subscribe to our social media and YouTube channels and head over to our website thinkinmuslim.com to sign up to my weekly newsletter. Jazakallah khair.